Nostalgia can be a double-edged blade. Sure, it's fun and even comforting to revisit your favorite media from the past, but many fall into the trap of wanting to protect the idea of that media because they identify so much with it. How many have cried that George Lucas ruined their childhoods when the Star Wars prequels didn't live up to the hype? How many railed against the new Ghostbusters, not for sexist reasons, but because the reboot indicated subtly that the original franchise with Venkman and Ray and Egon and Winston was now over, sealed, and could never be continued? Recently, Amazon Prime Studios, soon to be just Amazon Studios, hopefully, greenlit and produced a pilot that reboots Ben Edlund's The Tick. And if the internet is any indication, nostalgia has already made hardcore Tick fans range from going on insane comment section tirades to just not caring at all about yet another Hollywood reboot. Well, in this video, I'm going to investigate exactly why you should care in the first episode of Secret Screening. The Tick, the property, not the character, has the dubious honor of turning 30 this year. And while it hasn't been reimagined or rebooted nearly as much as the similarly old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Unlike other reboot targets, The Tick does have a unique problem. It existed as three distinctly different versions, in three very different mediums, appearing roughly once per decade. While there's nothing wrong with that, it does mean that The Tick has different bubbles of fandom, each with their own ideas of what's right or best for the property. The Tick began in 1986 as a satire of comic books of the time, and as such, this early version of The Tick was a little unhinged. He was prone to threats of violence, self-narration, and rooftop brooding. He began his adventure in the city after escaping from a mental institution where he was possibly created, or at the very least experimented on against his will. Much like popular characters of the time, like Marvel's Wolverine, The Tick's backstory was specifically clouded in mystery though it was clear that something was not quite right with him. The Tick poked fun at the campy trappings of Superman's secret identity and weakness. It mocked the needlessly serious tone and ninja-packed pages of Frank Miller's run on Daredevil. Edlin's sporadic issues of The Tick aimed their crosshairs at the grim and gritty tone of popular, more adult comic book stories of the time and purposefully thumbed its nose at their conventions and tropes. The comic's success led the way to 1994's animated series for Fox Kids, which is undeniably the most popular and best-known version of the property. Spanning 36 episodes over three seasons, The Tick was an absurdist masterpiece of superhero parody. But can you tell me, what do you do? Eh? I mean, what are your superhuman powers? Can you see through steel? Uh, you know, with x-rays, can you bend iron bars with your mind? Well, I, uh, no. Can you create energy-based multiples of yourself? Whoa, <laughs> nope. Can you make diamonds out of coal? No. Shoot heat beams out of your eyes? No. Breathe atomic fire? No. Hmm. <clears throat> well then, uh, can you destroy the Earth? Egad, I hope not. That's where I keep all my stuff. This version of The Tick was more prone to making boisterous, charismatic monologues on the true meaning of heroism to no one in particular, and enjoying life with a childlike zeal of whimsy and wonder. <laughs> Roof pig! Most unexpected! The process of getting The Tick on the air was a stressful one for Edlin, who was fresh from film school and had never produced a show before. But despite the trials and tribulations of its year-long production process, Edlin began working closely with Christopher McCullough, better known as Jackson Public, the co-creator of The Venture Brothers, a show that Edlin eventually helped produce and get on the air. Though The Tick did have problems finding an audience with young kids watching Saturday morning cartoons, it eventually found an older cult following when Comedy Central started airing the cartoon in the late 90s. 
This popularity with adult audiences gave the green light to Fox's attempt at creating a more adult-oriented, live-action primetime tick TV show. Goodbye, plucky, pimply team. Think you're ready now to hear the truth. This wasn't really a magic hubcap. The magic was inside you all along. But where the animated show proved to be problematic in its production, 2001's The Tick was a disaster. For starters, Sunbow Entertainment was bought by Disney, so they retained the rights to many of the animated show's popular characters, like Sewer Urchin, Chairface Chippendale, American Maid, and Deflator Mouse, which forced them to rename and redesign some of these characters as Captain Liberty and Batman Well. Back in bed with a CIA, huh? You certainly do your best work undercover. Stow it, you infant. I don't have time for your nonsense. Oh, you had a little time for it last month on top of that water tower. I shaved her too once, if you know what I'm saying. It ran horribly behind schedule and way over budget. The tick suit that Patrick Warburton wore was a nightmare to wear, and its radio-controlled antenna were prone to break, which forced Warburton to stay inside the suit, one in which he could barely breathe in even longer. And all the while, Eglin was fighting with the studio at every step as they cut the budget, forced script changes, and shoveled the show into a primetime slot in and around the World Series and aired it against the then hugely popular Survivor. Look! More strange treats from the Orient! Mm. 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 A secret message from my teeth! The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I don't get it. The show was canceled after just nine episodes, only eight of which originally aired on Fox. Despite the cancellation, though, the show's popularity led the way to a DVD release of the show. This, paired with digital streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon also hosting the series, allowed it to finally find its audience and fandom. And this, of course, led to Sony Pictures and Amazon Prime Studios reaching out to Ben Edlin to craft a new live-action series. A completely fresh and original take that finally does the show and its characters right. For the first time since The Tick graced the pages of New England Comics Newsletter and bounded into popularity, Fortune seemed to be once again smiling on The Tick. However, this second chance came with some very necessary changes. And as we all well know, nothing can bring a fan to their knees with mouth-foaming hatred faster than changes to their beloved intellectual property. The first big change was the recasting of both The Tick and Arthur from the 2001 version. And of course, this did not sit well with fans who assumed Patrick Warburton would be stepping back into the title role. But here's the good news. Patrick Warburton is still a part of the show, albeit behind the scenes. Although Warburton hasn't spoken about this publicly just yet, Ben Edlin has. In an amazing interview with Ed Gross of Empire, Edlin was asked why Warburton was not cast as The Tick, and he replied, It was a desire to try to do a complete reboot and have some new face be The Tick. I love Patrick, and he loves me. Ultimately, we were seeking a new expression of that character to try and sort of set ourselves apart from every other iteration that took place. I basically had been in an ongoing battle with them, going through many different drafts of the Tick script. We got to a place where they were finally ready to greenlight it, and then we started to talk about the real nuts and bolts of what they wanted to see as an expression of the pilot. That's where we came to find their dedication to do a new incarnation of this thing. It was at that point that Patrick graciously stepped aside and kept his producer role and went into this together with me. So as you can see, there are no hard feelings. And Patrick Warburton isn't out of a job, he's already found a sweet gig playing Lemony Snicket in a series of unfortunate events on Netflix. And he still gets to be a part of the creative process of this new series. It's win, win, win. The other big change was a visual one. Recently, Amazon Prime Studios released a series of production photos of the new Tick pilot, specifically of the newly cast Peter Serafanowicz in the new suit. And as you can see, 
have been some major changes. Rather than copy Warburton's one-piece smooth action figure open-faced Frankenstein's monster suit, Sarah Fanowitz's suit opts to have a full cowl, covering more of his face and harkening back to the look of the original comic book version of the tick. Further compounding matters was the relatively low resolution of these pictures, which magnified the confusing and ridiculous ridges, edges, and modular design of the new costume. Taking these stills with a grain of salt, it doesn't take a Herculean leap of logic to realize that the suit itself is a sly parody of the ridiculously over-designed and needlessly detailed superhero suits that have dominated films and TV of the past 14 years. Remember, Sam Raimi's raised webbing Spider-Man suit hit theaters in 2002, just one year after the first live-action tick was cancelled. But it was changes like these that panicked fans and rattled sabers. Losing Warburton was already a blow too far for many, and now that the suit was changed, it sparked articles like Evan Narcisi's io9 article, The Tick shows off more of its heroes, villains, and the main character's weird-ass new outfit a blunt article that gives away its bias right in the title. And it doesn't take too much digging in the comments to see that fans are already rejecting this version of The Tick without even seeing the pilot episode. And that's the reason I'm making this video. To reach out to fans of The Tick to let them know that they should give this pilot a chance. There is a specific reason I'm posting this video now, before the pilot airs, but before I reveal that reason, let's first go over the top three reasons why you should care about this reboot. Number one, experience. Since the failed 2001 Tick TV show, Ben Edlund has of course had a hand in the creation of the Venture Brothers, but more specifically, he was hired by Joss Whedon's Mutant Enemy as a staff writer on fan favorite Firefly. From there, he wrote and directed award-winning episodes of Angel, helped in the creation of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, and he was a producer, writer, and director for six seasons of Supernatural. Six seasons! He's even had a hand in Revolution, Gotham, and Powers for Sony's PlayStation Network. What I'm trying to say is that Ben Edlin has been learning the art of serialized genre television storytelling for the past 15 years. He's worked with, and is good friends with, Joss Whedon, the patron saint of genre TV. Unlike early Tick TV shows, he finally knows what he's doing. He understands how to be a showrunner, and how to keep projects on time and under budget. He understands structure, especially in serialized storytelling, which streaming services, always on the hunt for their next binge-worthy title, love the pants off of. Number two. Consequences. This is probably the most exciting news to come from Ed Gross's interview with Edlund. You see, a byproduct of the new serialized story that he's trying to tell in the Amazon series means that, unlike the very episodic adventures of the animated series and the 2001 live-action series, where there was no real continuity from episode to episode, in this new series, continuity will be at the forefront. The Tick has always been oblivious to the dangers around him and dangers others face because of the relative safety and privilege his powers afford him. He's nigh invulnerable and leaps before he looks. He can't even contemplate the possibility of permanent and life-altering injury because that's never been a worry for him. Everybody into the pool! <laughs> Close call, huh? Here's a little tip. Leap before you look. Since every action is locked into continuity, it raises the stakes of every choice the characters make. For example, if the Tick doesn't pull his punches when fighting someone without superpowers, then he is going to permanently hurt someone and the ramifications of that choice will factor into the rest of the new series. For instance, Ben Edlin brings up this exact scenario, where, thanks to a superpowered punch, a henchman eventually wakes up in the hospital with a new spine. Will this guy come back as some sort of robotic spined supervillain? 
Will he sue the Tick and Arthur into poverty for the damage they caused him? Will he turn the public against the two superheroes and paint them as dangerous to society? Only time and more episodes can tell. And the final reason is... Newness! <laughs> That's right! For better or worse, this is an entirely new story. A story, as Ben Edlin explains, that finally puts Arthur and his journey to become a superhero at the center. The power of the Tick has always been its ability to wrap a biting satire in a welcoming cast of characters that are honestly original and engaging in their own right. And this time we're getting a modern and realistic superhero origin story. Arthur Everest's origin story. That's right, they finally gave him a last name. I know. Believe me, I know. All you want to see is the Tick square off against Barry as Arthur thwarts the evil midnight bomber what bombs at midnight. You want to see American Maid bust up Chairface Chippendale's birthday party just a little too late. You want to see the Tick adopt a possibly speaking capybara, or go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thrakozog, or the Chainsaw Vigilante, or Paul the Samurai, or any number of classic scenes or characters, but I'm gonna let you in on a secret. You've already seen that. Sure, I would love to see this modern Arthur have to deal with being stuck in the sidekick's lounge behind the superhero club because Doorman won't let him in. And I'm sure we're going to see some form of that theme touched on again in the Tick's first season, but do you know what I would like to see even more? Anything else. Ben Edlin has given us adventures where the Tick squares off against the human ton and Andy. Don't you want to give him the freedom to discover and create something new and just as iconic to the series? If you limit him to a best-of compilation of scenes and stories, then you're likely just lining them up for comparison. Likely, the original will always be better than the new version. So why have I put together this impassioned plea? Because Amazon, basically. For those who don't know, because I didn't until recently, Unlike streaming services like Hulu and Netflix, who greenlight and produce full seasons of shows all at once, Amazon Prime does things differently. They greenlight and produce pilots, single episodes that they use to gauge interest before committing to more episodes. The problem is, they only leave these pilots online for one month. And from what I've read, they don't exactly have a vote button, they only sort of watch the amount of views it gets? And to make matters worse, there is painfully little information online on how this whole process works. At this moment, I don't know how to best tell people how to support the tick, other than to have people tune in this Friday, August 19th, when it goes live. The fact that this cool-looking, weird pilot for a brand new tick show is only available for a single month means we need to get the word out. Tell your friends and fellow fans who are on the fence about the show to just check it out. Share scenes and jokes and memes online because you better believe that someone is monitoring that stuff. Right on the heels of its release this Friday, I'll be watching the pilot and then uploading an honest review as soon as possible. I'll also fully investigate Amazon Prime and let you know if there's any additional steps you need to take in order to watch or vote for a full season of the show. Because Edland and his team deserve 10 episodes to tell their story, not just a pilot. And if the pilot actually is bad, believe me, I will be the first to admit it. But we'll also explore exactly what makes it so bad, and how they could possibly course correct if Edland and his team are greenlit for a whole series. That said, my secret inside sources are telling me that this is the real deal. And if they're to be believed, it's both hilarious and well-written, and possibly the best version of the Tick that has ever existed. Is this just hyperbole? Find out next time, when I investigate the Tick's 2016 Amazon Prime pilot. Until then, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next episode, because you'll always have a ticket for my next secret screening. Stay weird.